morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please record your presence with us today by signing the friendship pass, which are located in the central aisle of the passing to your neighbor. There is a change in the bulletin this morning, reversing the order of the first and second hymn. So hymn 314 is first, and hymn 251 is the middle hymn, and it's not in your hymn note, it's in the insert in the bulletin. MOFH will have a meeting at the church service today downstairs in the supper room. Also, MF, MOFH will be presenting the movie The Shack on Sunday, April 29th, 4 p.m. at Gene Humphrey's house. There is a sign-up sheet in the back just to let us know how many people um, intend to come. As we announced last week, there is a box of DVDs from past church service services that are up back. Please feel free to take as many as you want. There is one catch. If you take it, you don't bring it back. Good morning, everybody that's here. Uh, you probably were here last week and heard this, but it doesn't Eight casseroles, two salads, three red punch, workers, especially someone to greet and see. So if this speaks to you, there's a sign up sheet up back. And if you haven't signed up for anything, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So as you guys know, we're still taking donations for uh, the gifts of the heart disaster relief kits. And um, I just want to thank everyone so far for all the donations you guys have given. Like, it's amazing. I cannot believe how much donations we've had so far. So, if you wish to donate more, we would greatly appreciate it. So, thank you. And the Sunday night gatherings of the next fifth feast, it ends tonight. Now, I know you had to have a, it was a twofer, you had to come two nights. So, if you missed the first night and want to come about 10 after 5, Today, you can watch the first half of the movie and then we'll, the rest of us will come and finish it at 6 o'clock. So my house, 6 o'clock, 6 to 8, and uh, that's all I can say.
but sin not. Commune with your own heart on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, O oh, that we might see some good. Lift up the light of thy countenance upon us, O Lord. God has put more joy in my heart than they have with the grave in my heart. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for thou alone, O Lord, make it be well in safety.
may notice that we have placed in the bulletin children's sermon, just in case any children come. This is a reminder, because occasionally they're here. And it being an icy day, I guess they're somewhere else. Are they on skiing? Across the street, okay. You can go get it if you want. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
who I think we can safely say is the patron saint of our own Miriam Bisbee. I'm sorry she's not here <coughs> to hear the story of the patron saint. The story ends with the famous line uttered by Jesus himself <coughs> to Thomas the Doubter. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We are all in the latter category. Those who have not seen Jesus in the flesh and yet believe. We have heard the stories. We've heard the gospel. And so we believe. And so it has been for some 2,000 years. <clears throat> of course, we also do more than just hear stories. We also benefit from Christian witnesses and other witnesses whose lives and teachings give us a glimmer of what Jesus was like and inspire us. <clears throat> we have benefited from the example of a great cloud of witnesses, and that is how the Holy Spirit works. <clears throat> Last week I mentioned two of my teachers, Flora Wolner and Zalman Schachter. Today I'll tell you about another of my recent living teachers, and then talk about another teacher, the greatest ever, namely Jesus, and we will see how their teachings relate, but mostly on how the teachings and spirit of Jesus can help us to get through the day. The contemporary teacher of the day is named Jack Cornfield, <clears throat> whom I met in California a couple of times, um, a couple of decades ago. We have a college in common, namely Dartmouth, which he attended before I got there. <clears throat> After he graduated, he joined the Peace Corps, went to Thailand, and stayed on there for several years. He found a Buddhist teacher somehow, entered a monastery, where they taught meditation, got very good at it, and became quite passionate about it. You may have heard of meditation, <clears throat> and even tried it at some point. There are many traditions of meditation, and most of us meditate from time to time, perhaps without, um, without even knowing it. Many people practice cat and dog meditation, for example. Cats themselves are masters of meditation. They can sit still for hours on end, no problem. Dogs, on the other hand, are not meditators. They are doers or dozers, one or the other, on or off. Anyway, those of us who either have either or both of these pets can sit with their pets for hours with the cat purring in your lap, <clears throat> or with the dog sleeping at your feet, and who needs to do anything else? You just sit, and when you're doing that, you are in fact meditating, and meditating quite capably at that. Anyway, Jack Cornfield's school of meditation is called loving-kindness meditation. Some forms of meditation are rather austere. The teacher tells you to just sit and watch your thoughts, then watch yourself watching your thoughts, then watch yourself watching yourself, watch yourself, watch your thoughts, and eventually you just give up and just sit. <clears throat> With perseverance, I am told I haven't succeeded that this great peacefulness descends or arises, and some people swear by it and can sit for hours thinking of nothing. Jack's school was quite different. His teachers emphasized not just watching your thoughts and eventually ceasing thought altogether, but loving your thoughts. Loving yourself, loving the person watching your thoughts, loving the people you're thinking about, hence the term loving kindness meditation. So after a few years in the monastery, 
down there in Thailand. Having felt all this love welling up within and enjoying the peacefulness, Jack decided to return to America, teach meditation, and use meditation to help people live their lives in this wonderful, crazy, frantic, heartbreaking society that we live in. How did it go? Well, at first it was a disaster. <clears throat> people tried to meditate with loving kindness and just couldn't do it in the living, limited time available for a meditation class. He tried to offer advice for living, <clears throat> but people found it impractical. In short, after not very long, he wasn't feeling the love anymore. He wasn't able to help people, and he wasn't himself navigating around the shoals of life outside of the monastery. I'll save you the whole story of how he developed a spiritual practice that helps people. Suffice it to say that he did. He learned how to make this transition, and his retreat center is thriving, his book's selling. He has a good life, and he deserves it. His teaching is sound, and he lives by what he teaches. I simply tell you the story about Jack, the American Buddhist, who teaches loving kindness meditation because he gives us a glimmer of what Jesus must have been like and what Jesus must have taught. For Jesus surely practiced loving kindness meditation. We just haven't called it that. We know that he prayed often, another word for meditation. The Bible tells us that. We also know that Jesus did a lot more. He healed people, <clears throat> he died and rose from the dead, that's pretty important. And he taught us to love one another quite indiscriminately. Indeed, Jesus taught us to practice loving kindness quite indiscriminately and passionately at all times. He also healed people. A huge percentage of the Gospels are stories of Jesus healing people. He was an equal opportunity healer. He healed just about everybody who came up to him. People from his own tribe and people from other tribes, Samaritans as well as Jews, sinners as well as saints, and the son of a Roman centurion as well. He taught about the kingdom of God and God, of course, but most importantly for today's sermon, he taught us that God loves all of us with overwhelming, indiscriminate love. As Jesus healed everybody, so God loves everybody, including, and even especially including, your enemies. This is where the message of Jesus gets really difficult to fathom. For Jesus unmistakably taught us to love our enemies. There's ample biblical record of this. This is the real challenge. It's not hard to love your friends. Well, actually some days it is rather difficult. <laughs> but it's nearly impossible to love your enemies. <clears throat> Nonetheless, that is what Jesus taught. So the big question is, how? How do we bring such loving kindness into our lives? If not for our enemies, the ultimate challenge, how can we bring some loving kindness into our lives, at least for our friends and the ordinary people around us? So I suggest that, oddly enough, the first thing you must have is faith. You must have faith that all that God did for Jesus, God did for you, for us, for every one of you. As they say in the South, for all of y'all. If you don't believe that God loves you, or at least that you yourself are worthy of love, how can you spread the love around? So that's where it starts. And thus, despair, cynicism, resignation, disappointment might be the deadliest sins of all and the greatest obstacles to a good life, which is why the Gospels are so full of exhortations to have faith. Today's readings. You may not be able to move mountains with faith, but without it, you really can't do very much at all. Okay, assume then <clears throat> that you have faith 
and you want to follow Jesus and do some good in the world. You want to stop being part of the problem and become part of the solution. You want to make the world a bit better. <clears throat> you want to act with loving kindness. You want to stop reacting to life's challenges. You want to respond from some deep place of love, kindness, and compassion. Now, isn't that what we all want to do? How? Well, the answer is lengthy. <clears throat> this morning, just a beginning. I'd say the beginning of that long answer, in addition to self-acceptance, is accepting the world the way it is. Accept yourself in this world the way you are and the world is because God made it all and God don't make no junk. Okay? And Jesus taught this amazing radical teaching that God reigns God's love on everybody. Well, okay, if that's really the case, then, then what's our hurry? I mean, what is our hurry to fix everything? C.S. Lewis once wrote that hurry is not just of the devil, but hurry is the very devil itself. I think there's something to that. Think of the messes we have made because we were in a hurry. <clears throat> so, if you're not in a hurry, and God did not take off on vacation and leave you in charge, which he didn't, you may act. You don't have to act. Maybe that takes some pressure off. So, we don't have this voice in our head making us react and react and react because we think we have to. It's up to us. We've got to save the world quick. Hurry up faster now. Take a deep breath. Love that difficult situation. Love those difficult people. Love those awful enemies. And then maybe just maybe a loving kindness, non-violent alternative just may arise. Maybe. So, just a simple example. I hate checkout lines. <laughs> checkout lines are my spiritual challenge. I don't like being in stores to start with. Once I've gotten everything I want, I want to get out of there as quickly as possible. And I think there are a lot of people like me standing in that line, oh my. Are we having fun? No, we're not having fun. We are not having fun. But yesterday, I had the presence of mind to just chat the person in front of me. We'd say in England, I, I chatted her up. I chatted her up. I said, how are you doing today? She looked at me as if that was the most startling thing that anyone had ever said in months. And she said, fine. How are you? I said, I'm fine. Once I get through this checkout line, I'm going to the swimming pool, so I'm going to feel a lot better. And she said, well, I'm going on vacation. I'm going away for a few days. Oh, really? Where are you going? Westbrook. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm checking into a hotel in Westbrook that has a pool and a hot tub and a sauna, and that's my, that's my vacation. Okay, all right, and then you know, the line opened up and we buzzed on through, and that was that. So just one little tiny opportunity to open up some air and some space and some light in life. Really <coughs> worthwhile. And I don't claim to be particularly good at this. Another of my teachers, Walter Wink, my uh, New Testament instructor and, uh, at, at seminary, talked about this and did whole classes on how to look for the nonviolent alternative in the midst of a rough situation. 
And just to close things off here, you might have heard the serenity prayer. It might be the best prayer in the business. I think we'll start using it more often. It was cooked up by another teacher of mine indirectly, Reinhold Niebuhr. I never studied with him, but I know people who did. And he came up with the serenity prayer. And Reinhold Niebuhr was fun. One very serious, politically active, socially, ethically, utterly, totally engaged, real rough, tough, serious person. So you could you could believe this wonderful, light-hearted, sweet-tempered prayer that he wrote. You know what it is. God grant me the courage to change what I can change, the serenity to accept what I can't change, and the wisdom to know the difference. I call that the wisdom to choose your battles. Another anecdote, this is one of my favorites. You all have heard of uh, General Patton, General George Patton. He was one rough, tough, nasty-minded human being, the sort of guy that you want to fight for you when the time comes. He was very impolitic, very impolitic. He said all sorts of dumb things. And General Eisenhower, who was a friend and his commanding officer throughout World War II, said of George, George has passed up more opportunities to say nothing than anyone else I've ever known. <coughs> Sometimes discretion is the bitter part of valor. Well, may all these stories be our guide in the months and weeks and years ahead. Amen. Amen. That's a good sermon. <laughs>
Okay, now it's time to share whatever is sitting lightly on your heart. Share us your share with us your joys. <clears throat> I felt very pleased yesterday that we were trying to look at a hopeless friend. I saw 12 robins in my backyard, picking away at the grass. Wow. Spring is coming. Today I'm 42, and in four days now I'm going to be 43. Oh. <laughs> I'm going on paper because these are what Jan wrote for me to do. <laughs> I'm a good toad. I always do what I'm told. Uh, Isabella turns three tomorrow. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> yesterday they took her out for horseback riding, a uh, uh, lesson. And this kid's got no fear. I, I, thought, I thought she would have been too afraid to get up on a big horse. But no, she loved it. I mean, she would probably climb a roof on the house. But uh, no, she had a good time. And then she also told me to pass on that the new small town bakery cafe at Coal Farms opens tomorrow at 6 a.m. And she's real excited about this and she's going to be helping with that. It has been my joy and privilege to spend the last 15 months helping with the care of Barbara Humphrey, taking her to appointments and such. And my joy this morning is that she is no longer weak and discouraged.
in this church, in this community, and around the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.